session ma'am she she will be the moderator and the co moderator is mr amol arora captain dinisha thank you so much mr pranav uh, and a very very good afternoon from malaysia and good morning mm -hmm. india bangladesh and uh, nepal uh, I'm Captain Dr. Dinesha. Mr. Pranav has gone to uh, introducing my color of blood. That is uh, uh, that uh, signify that is signified by my first name. That is Captain because I call it as olive green is the color of my blood being part of Indian Army. So uh, it's uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you, sponsor. It is wonderful being here with the with the dignitaries who are uh, the torch bearers as far as the field of education is concerned. We've Before I start, just one thing. So, Mr. Pan told me that uh, you know uh, we need to listen to them more. I remember in my college days, I wanted to meet my VC and I could not. And I am meeting so many VCs today on virtual platforms. So it is a high. It's a matter of real privilege for me and uh, moderating this session. So, uh, without wasting much time now, before uh, we uh, move on. Uh, i take this opportunity to uh, you know uh, rather i create this opportunity for our, all of us to listen to uh, professor mm M. pant uh, you know when i asked uh, mr uh, pranav that uh, uh, what should be the introduction which i should be giving though i know him and i think everybody knows him and he is a stalwart as far as the field of education is concerned a leadership trainer i had a privilege of hearing him in one of our schools in singapore in our uh, leadership summit so without wasting much time and the person who doesn't need any introduction i request professor pants to come forward and uh, address the gathering he is our keynote speaker for today sir over to you so thank you captain for these initial remarks and welcoming and agreeing to be the moderator of the show uh i have already written a note of about 1000 words or so which can be read in 5 minutes and i think pranav has circulated this to everybody yeah so the the uh, point is i want to say a few things uh by way of uh, the drivers of this thought process now the first thing is that uh, many people are kind of curious when they see the phrase learning 3 to 1 or education 3 to 1 and i will spend some time explaining why i am using this phrase 3 to 1 see i am one of those who saw the beginnings of the computer sort of i wouldn't say revolution but computer induction into india around 1980s mid 80s actually and at that time the 21st century was a kind of a you know uh landmark or a time frame for which we all aspired and we thought we should all be ready for the 21st century preparing for the 21st century and digital skills were for 21st century now 21st century has come and gone there are two decades already over of the 21st century and very often people still talk about them as 21st century skills 21st century learning and so on and what i want to draw attention to is that one whole century won't go in the same way so thinking that we have a certain model or certain thoughts which will be uh, throughout the 21st century is unlikely to be true so there may be something which will prevail but there's a times a very rapid change and therefore i said let's look at about a decade so we are at the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century and 3 to 1 therefore is for the third decade of the 21st century about which we can say in some things the larger the horizon we take the more difficult it is going to be to be able to talk of something which is practical and useful uh, another way in which i use 3 to 1 is that it is a countdown to take off so we've been talking about this for a long time and we say 10 9 8 7 and now i'm saying 3 to 1 it's time to take off and the note that i have kind of circulated is about this it is about now trying to take off to whatever the new models of education are and uh, i've talked about 3 to 1 saying that this will be okay for the next 10 years or so we should not think this is going to be forever and so on so forth so that's one of the reasons why i use the term 3 to 1 it's more question of talking about time frame in which we are talking the second thing that i want to draw your attention to is the size of the challenge uh you all have an idea of how big the education system here is in india and the size of the education system and the higher education system 
and I won't go into those figures, uh, they're huge figures. Uh, what I will say is that the World Economic Forum in January 2020 meeting actually said that because of the various changes that are happening, we, the world needs to reskill about a billion people by the year 2030. And if you recall, I was talking about the 70s and 80s, Alvin Toffler at the time had said that the illiterates of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So we are in, now in that stage where it is no longer enough to say that you had this thing, you had graduates and you had a 50% GER or whatever. You have to re-educate those graduates who have graduated in the past. So it's not enough that we could, today we are like 26% GER or whatever, but the re-education of a lot of it. So the photo total size of the task is of the order of one tenth of a billion, one twentieth of a billion, whatever level you want to take it. Now, what is important is, and I want to draw attention over here. So the old model cannot work. So trying to say that uh, from Woods Dispatch to McCollum model to various things, Kothari Commission, 86 policy, 2020 policy, all this will not be able to meet the challenges. That can be a good job. You can pat yourself on the back for having done it. But if you're looking at the challenge, the challenge is educating large numbers very rapidly in new emerging areas of knowledge. And that is why it is important to look at the kind of discussion that we're talking about. Now, the drivers for innovation broadly are, in terms of management theory, are two very well known. And I want to draw your attention to that. One is coming out from INSEAD from Paris, which is a, almost even today is called number one uh, business school. So there's a book by uh, Kim and Rene Moba on blue ocean strategy. And what they say in blue ocean strategy is that you have to look at completely new ways of doing things, often called value innovation. And it is in contrast to red ocean strategy, which is what everybody is doing. There are 3000 universities, now one more university, two more universities, that's one kind of thing. The other person who talks about disruptive innovation is Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen uh, was a professor at Harvard University, well known for innovation, he passed away a couple of years due to cancer. Uh, and he had lots of things on disruptive innovation. His very famous Clarendon lecture at Oxford University on what is disruptive innovation. But his colleagues then asked him one day, that you're talking disruption everywhere. Where is the disruption in education, if and when and how? And so he wrote a book called Disrupting Class. And he summarizes the disruption in education by saying the disruption in education is not the use of technology or deployment of technology. It is the personalization of the learning experience. And I think this is very, very important for us to appreciate that the traditional models of education are homogenization. Same curriculum, same this thing, same test, same exam, et cetera, et cetera. And we are talking now in terms of disruption as personalization of the learning experience. And this is going to be a huge transformational thing. The other thing that I wanted to uh, share with you was that I've been part of the IIT system. So I have a PhD from IIT. I mean, it was Roorkee University, now it's called IIT. I was a faculty member in IIT Kanpur for about 10 years, a member of the board of management of IIT Delhi for about six years. And I've also been with the Indira Gandhi National Open University for more than a decade. So we had these two axioms. Either you can have high quality education for a few, or you can have kind of mass education for the many, but the two cannot coexist. And what I'm trying to say is, it is time is now to make the two coexist. That you give a soul of an IIT education to whoever wants it, whether he is capable of passing the entrance exam or not, et cetera, et cetera. And this is in keeping with the thoughts on personalization that I said. Now, one very important thing I want to draw attention to, and fortunately we saw that because of the pandemic, that mobile will be the actual device for the future if you want to reach large numbers. And this has been being kind of, you know, uh, evangelized by UNESCO for the last 10 years almost. Every year they have a mobile week, world uh, conference, 
of course, because of pandemic, it was not happening in person yet. But they've been trying to promote why the mobile is such a great device for learning and especially to reach. And we know the data over here at present. If you could put your education on a mobile, uh, you will be able to reach a lot more people and with many more things today that are there. Another idea that I want to share with you, and uh, I like its adoption, is an idea from a Nobel laureate called Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom is an economics, was an economics professor in Bloomington University, Indiana. She got the 2009 Nobel Prize in Economics, first woman to get a Nobel Prize in Economics. The second one is Esther Duplo, who got it recently, Abhijit's wife. But the point is, she got a Nobel Prize for a very interesting thing. Very often, the Nobel Prizes are, in economics are given to modeling the stock market or this or that or something. But she got a Nobel Prize for upsetting a widely held belief. So there was a paper by Garrett Hagen called, called Tragedy of the Commons. And the basic principle there was that if something is held in common, it will get into disuse, destroys, and so on and so forth. And therefore, the idea was, and in India, a huge issue with respect to tribal living, et cetera, et cetera. If the government manages it, then it will be managed whether or not. Or if the private sector manages it, and now there is a huge glorification of the private sector. Elena Ostrom's work showed that if a community who's involved with it manages it, the results are better than either of the government or of the private sector. She got a Nobel Prize for that, but nobody wants to talk about her work. The government doesn't want to tell you that you can do it better than us, and the private sector doesn't want to tell you that you can do it better than us. I feel education is something which will be best done by the learning community itself. So this is one of the basic ideas I'm proposing in this, rather than one part of taking the lead, et cetera, and saying, I'll create a big company, et cetera, saying, let the community do this. And Elena Ostrom laid down principles of how to manage a community which is holding things in common. And we have seen, for example, the progress in science is because the science is community, not authorized. There is no global level authority of science. It's a community of science practitioners. And that's why science has progressed in the last 100 years. And even Einstein, with all this thing, when he was proved wrong, people said, yes, he's wrong. And the other experimentalists who proved something else, the Bell's theorem and Bell's inequality for entanglement, they were accepted. It was, no, how can you say that? Einstein has said it. You cannot say anything against Einstein. No. Similarly, I'm talking of a learning community. Today, education is driven largely by authority. The vice chancellor says, by virtue of the authority vested in me as vice chancellor, I can't. He doesn't say, you and I have discussed, we debated, we argued, we agreed to disagree. And now you are a mature person who can think like an adult thinker, independent thinker, and so on. So anyway, my practical model I'm trying to propose here, as you would have seen in the note that I have, is that we create a learning community which takes this further. And now finally, all the limitations of the present thing, every, the reason why we cannot scale an IIT or a St. Stephen's or something else and so on, much of this is being solved by artificial intelligence. So very briefly, the model will be mobile as a front end, human intelligence and artificial intelligence at the back end, and gradually more and more human intelligence is facilitated by artificial intelligence so that the academics can focus on the higher order things. So they don't have to do routine things about grading exams, setting question papers, et cetera, or answering several queries. I will share with you a few stories on this to tell you that this is all now happening. It is no longer something which is theoretical. So one of the most interesting stories in this is that from a professor Ashok Goel of Indian origin, who was in Georgia Tech. Uh, let me give this in a bit of detail so you'll appreciate the aspect. So Georgia Tech a few years ago decided that they will open up their course. They had a very good course called Masters in Computer Science, which is very popular. And they said, we'll open this to the entire world as an online course. Now you're seeing we are also doing a lot more, but they did it a few years ago. So when this online course was opened up, suddenly they had, let us say, 10,000 students. Now, typically, professors are used to a couple of hundred students or less, et cetera, and they have a couple of teaching assistants which provide that. Now, when you have 10,000 students on an online platform, every day you will get 100,000 
post on the chat box asking for various things. And one of the hallmarks of a good education is how swift is the feedback. If you respond fast enough, the engagement or interest will remain. If you ask a question in March and you reply in September, there is going to be no interest in the learning, whatever. So when this was done, what happens is that Professor Ashok Goel was given number of teaching assistants that they were allocated. That this hundred students, you will respond. This you will respond. And something which is very difficult for you to respond, it will escalate to the professor. But being a computer scientist, Ashok Goel created an AI teaching assistant and put it among them. So if there were 10 assistants, nine were human, 10th was an AI assistant, and he used a technology called Watson, IBM Watson, and he gave this teaching assistant a female identity, so he called her Jill Watson. Throughout the course, people could not figure out whether the Steve is answering the question or Jill is answering the question. They were more or less similar. So what I'm trying to say is that this is already established. Now I will tell you about our Indian story also. Again, a recent story. So uh, there is uh, in uh, UP Technical University called APJ Kalam Technical University. And his vice chancellor is somebody whom I know, so Vinay Pathak. And when I was propagating and evangelizing AI, he called me one day for a general chat and I told him, what kind of a graduates will you produce? You'll call them engineers and they will have no idea what is AI, what is machine learning, what is IoT, what is this thing? How can you do that? And he was swayed by the idea. And I told him a similar cooperative model that take all the people who are in your various colleges of I said, uh, don't have it as a course from somebody else imposed on you. Take your, your so many colleges, there are teachers in colleges, etc. Ask them to make a few lectures, etc. And in the Indira Gandhi University, we used to do things in this way. Uh, to cut a long story short, he has created that course, and every engineer who will come out of UP Technical University will have a fair amount of awareness of what all this means. And not only that, I said you also show a demonstration. So they created a chatbot. They gave it some name, I think, uh, forgetting the name. Uh, but the ch chatbot will answer all questions about when does the admission start, when does this happen, what is the calendar, et cetera, et cetera. And people can ex uh, access it from anywhere. In future, and not so distant future, we'll have chatbots for every professor. We'll have a chatbot for a vice chancellor. We'll have chatbot for a registrar. So that much of the routine things which is distractive can be done by those machines and they will be available 24 by seven. And the students don't have to send an application request, they just talk to it, like you talk to Alexa or Siri or Cortana or whatever. So this is the future that I am envisaging. What I've given in that note is a kind of a set of practical ideas on which we can go that we can say, let's pull together 50 courses from 10 institutions and do this and give them badges, et cetera, et cetera. And the rest of the story actually, uh, the people who are here, will evolve and take it further. So thank you, Captain. Uh, oh, Captain, my Captain, thank you. And now you can take it over and uh, moderate the session and request other people to make their contributions. I'm uh, uh, Captain Dinesh, I'll just introduce uh, everyone. I think I know everyone uh, personally also. Fine, ma'am. OK, OK, please. All we have Mr. Rahul Bhatia with us from scholarshiptest.com. We have Mr. Jamshed Barucha. He's the Vice Chancellor of Sai University, Chennai. Right now, he's uh, doing the video conferencing from US. He's there for a couple of uh, months, I suppose, I was there. We have Dr. S. M. Mehboob Ulhak. He's a Pro Vice Chancellor of Daffodil International University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. We have Mr. Tarun Anand. He's the founder of Universal Business School, Karzat, Mumbai. Beautiful institution. We have Dr. Amit Bhadra with us, Vice Chancellor, Waxham University, Hyderabad. We have our famous uh, Professor Kamlesh Mishra, he's the Vice Chancellor of Rishud University and he has set up many universities. We have Dr. Kuldeep Singh, he's a Dean of Ames Jaipur, uh, Jodhpur. We have Professor Ranjit Singh, he's a Vice Chancellor of Shobhita University. We have Dr. Abhay Kumar, he's a Vice Chancellor of Pratap University. We have Madam Arshana Surana, she's the founder and MD of Arch College of Design and Business, Jaipur. We have Dr. Hari Krishna Maran, he's the uh, Vice Chancellor and Founder of Vision uh, and Digital University. We have Mr. Sandeep, uh, Sandeepam Reddy. We have uh, Dr. T. Raj Khania. He is the former Vice Chancellor of Tribhuvan University, uh, uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. And we have got Professor V. Ramgopal Rao. 
He's a director of IIT Delhi. Yes, Captain. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Pranav. Uh, and thank you so much, Pant sir. Uh, I had gone through the wonderful concept note of Education Three Two One, where you mentioned that it is third decade decade of twenty first century, and we need to move forward uh, from uh, uh, the the rigid thought process which we have in the process of education in uh, current era where it is authority driven or power driven to more of uh, you know learners driven and uh, now i'm sure uh, all our learning guests must be having a lot of queries and questions instead of me inviting everyone i request you raise your hand and then uh, we'll uh, we'd love to hear you uh, i request you raise virtual hand because all the uh, screens are not visible to me on uh, my screen. professor kamlesh has raised the hand Uh, Professor Kamlesh, oh, the forum is over to you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, my my question, uh, in fact, I I was uh, I'm I'm a great fan and supporter of Professor Pant yeah, and his his uh, thought process, uh, and I was listening very very uh, carefully uh, to what he had to say and. and obviously it's very very uh, interesting and intriguing uh so there is some connectivity issue yeah professor kamlesh we can't hear you uh i think uh, we are uh, losing professor oh. kamlesh uh, kind of a world are we going to so your audio is not clear professor kamlesh your audio is not clear okay just just give me one second it's okay now now it is can better can you hear me now yes yes now it is much okay better. yeah so uh, my my uh, as i said that i i agree with the, his views as to where we might be going uh i wanted to get some perspective from him that in this process of over emphasis of the growth of technology and artificial intelligence is it possible that we will dehumanize education to such an extent that it may have an adverse impact on the new student body it's just a thought uh, and i wanted to get his perspective because i think he's he's one of those visionaries who will have no, no, a lot of thought about it actually professor kamlesh mishra you have raised the most important question i had moved more about how we can start doing it but you have raised almost a question whether we should do that now this is one of the most important question which is there in human minds that how do we keep the balance between the technology and the human being and in a sense maintain the role now my response to this is very simple and lots of people have thought over it so there is a person called uh, joseph aun who is president of northeastern university uh, who has written a book on this uh, max tegmark is a physicist who has talked about this uh, elon musk has very clearly said this can be dangerous and so on so forth but if you look at it somewhat uh, uh, let's say objectively if we can anticipate what might go wrong we can create those correction processes so the big good thing about human body is in fact i was you know human body also has homeostasis if temperature goes high it does something to correct it and so on so the expectation is that we will build ai which will fulfill our purposes solve our purposes what we cannot do so fast or well it will help us do it but will eventually be conforming to our things and this is a big debate and it is quite possible that there may be a set of people who might as you might call rogue people who might actually use it for destructive thing this has happened with nuclear thing this has happened with bio things this in fact even today you know you have conspiracy theory of whether the virus was uh, deliberately released and so on so forth so this thing will be there the general uh, hope is that people who are thinking in the right direction will harness it for that purposes so this is exactly the thing and if we are not able to do that there would be a problem so it is expected that the thought leaders and that is why if you recall i have emphasized so much let it be community driven not driven by just profiteers 
or authorities and so on. So when a community driven approach is there, it will look at the welfare of the community and therefore create things which will be on that kind. But surely uh, this has happened. And in fact, I was very young when the nuclear bombs were kind of exploded and there was a huge thing about the social responsibility of the scientists. And uh, sometimes it was said whether, see, had Einstein not instigated the US to make the bomb, they were nowhere the bomb, because Germany which was making the bomb. But Einstein, because as a Jew, he was very persecuted by Hitler. He kind of advised the US to make the bomb and so on and so forth. Principal, so, I, I just wanted to ask you a follow-up question and I, yes. I want to be brief because I don't want to take away time from everybody else. Uh, you know, my, my, my fear and, uh, is that, uh, and I wanted to get your personal view on, on this because that's important for me. Uh, you know, I, I feel that if we uh, go through this uh, at the pace that we are trying to go or we are forecasting that uh, technology will get into higher education, uh, I personally feel that the process of dehumanization will be also at, at a very, very rapid pace. Uh, and if we are going to uh, remove that human touch from education, what what is your personal view of so, the impact that may have? So, firstly, I am not at all talking about removing the human touch. Okay. I am saying humans should do tasks which are worthy of humans, right? So we first uh, remove the menial tasks. So writing the question paper, making copies of the question paper, typing, copying the carbon paper, etc. See, as you know, and this is a very interesting thing, and one of the things which fascinates me at this stage of my life, biologically, we are all very similar, right? Even if you go into this thing, you know, DNA is 99% same. This is there. Our brains are roughly similar size, similar roughly narrow. But what humans can do varies in capacity. I mean, Einstein's work still 100 years later, we are not able to understand. He had more or less a similar brain. So the whole idea is that let uh, this will allow, just like we said, that if you are, see, if you look at a few hundred years ago, everyone had to do everything from growing crops to doing this, to guarding yourself and so on and so forth. As you were able to do that, and you were able to look at, you were able to look at the bigger questions. And uh, I'm sure you have uh, read about it. Abraham Flexner, the founder of Indigenous Science, he had a, he has a lecture book, everything called the uselessness of, I mean, the usefulness of useless knowledge. So we explore things just like that. So in fact, if you look at all the work of Einstein, he says, I'm trying to think of what, uh, what is it? I'm trying to understand God's mind. What is he doing? So when we look around us, there are so many things and which we are not able to do because we end up doing lower level tasks. The idea is when a lower level task is taken by automation, it becomes, it does not compromise the higher thing at all. In fact, if you, if you look at the progress that we have had now, you are uh, in the academia. See, 300 years ago, there was no science. Only with Royal Society, some science started coming. There was no medicine. 400 years ago, circulation of blood. 100 years ago, they did not have a blood pressure instrument, etc. But look at the rapid pace in the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, because many of the other things, see, if taking a spectrogram and interpreting it took you six months, now you can do it in six minutes. You can do a lot more. Genome sequencing. Would genome sequencing ever be possible without the technology? So the whole idea is that it is humans who take the decision. It is their curiosity, but things which would have taken infinite amount of times now take finite times. And this is the big thing. And we will, uh, most people, unfortunately, uh, have to spend, see, we live in so much that brilliant people are spending time in administration as vice chancellor rather than contributing to the discipline. This is the pet lemon that we have. So if it is going to, equally true, it is that if it goes into the wrong hands, and that's why we are looking at world bodies with regulate uh, nuclear things and uh, viral things and so on and so forth. I often say that when I'm teaching artificial intelligence, I often teach my students by saying, see, I'm trying to teach you, you are struggling. If I had the entire underworld as my student, Daud Ibrahim was my student, <laughs> this was my student, I would be a very powerful man. Rightly, <laughs> rightly brought out, sir. <laughs> rightly brought out. If uh, that community is your student, they'll take it rather fast forward. And, right. you know, so, 
<laughs> the answer to Professor Kamlesh Mishra is this, that the right people thinking in society have to manage that. And that is why, in fact, why awareness is very important is that most decisions are being taken by the political class yeah, who's not aware of these. That's very dangerous. And that's very dangerous. <laughs> you remember C.P. Snow, he said that two cultures. C.P. Snow talked of two cultures, those who know science and those who know arts, and he was talking about Oxford and Cambridge, and he kind of said this is a very dangerous thing if the two cultures don't talk to each other. So it is very important that uh, this idea of massification, people understanding, is important because consequences are going to be there. And I have a very fa favorite uh, statement. So I also have a law background. I practiced as a lawyer for seven years. And in law, there is a principle called ignorance of the law is no excuse. So you cannot say, I didn't know it. I said, in life, ignorance is no excuse. And you cannot say, I didn't know AI will have a <laughs> consequence. I didn't know that cloning. And now we're not cloning. We're talking synthetic biology. You can create completely. So, in fact, very interestingly, from a perspective of science, science is now moving. In fact, uh, you might have uh, noticed that the year 2020 was called the beginning of the Anthropocene age, when man-made matter had become greater than the natural biomass of the planet. So, already we have reached that stage that we are creating more stuff. The other thing that is happening is so far, what scientists have been doing is trying to understand nature. So what is the DNA like? What is this like? What was the nuclear atom like from Mendeleev table to atom to chemistry to this? Now it's the other way around. We make things and wonder what the consequences will be. So we can make a genetic, you know, CRISPR, Cas9, we can do some genetic editing, but we have no idea what will happen. And it is a very interesting situation. And maybe this is the key human challenge today, how to keep humanity on track now that you have very powerful things. So... You will know Harari has talked about the Lord, Max Tegmark has talked about a lot of different things. You have given atomic bombs to sheep. Now, what will they do with it? You have no idea. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pan, sir. Yeah. Uh, the bottom line is that technology, people say that it is a double-edged weapon. I say that it is a devil. Either you control it or it will control you. So thank you so much for a wonderful question, Professor Kamlesh. Now I take this opportunity to invite uh, Professor Ram Gopal Rao of IIT Delhi to uh, express his views. And uh, I simultaneously request because uh, the list is long and all are very learned people. So uh, we uh, try to keep our uh, words in little candid mode. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you. Professor Ram Gopal, is uh, he there? He needs to unmute. Muting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I hope you are able to hear me. No problem. Yep. Yes, yes. And look yes, forward sir, to hearing yours. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, we are discussing uh, what, uh, so we are, at, for example, one of the things that uh, I feel we need to do in our educational institutions is uh, this diversity. Our institutions are very homogeneous. That is our biggest challenge right now. When I say homogeneous, uh, you know, engineering institutions only will have engineers and IITs are so, and uh, medical institutions will have only medical doctors. And I think that homogeneity is what is now coming in the way of us becoming creative. So creativity happens when unlike minds come together. If I start interacting with people who don't think like me, who don't behave like me, who don't even have the same background as I have, when we start interacting, the new ideas will come up. And in India, the, this fragmented higher education, you know, by, by having institutions which are dedicated to only one particular area is what is uh, coming in the way. So, I strongly believe that we need to bring these unlike minds together in our institutions. At IIT Delhi, for example, we said we define unlike minds in three ways. One is, uh, you know, people with different cultural backgrounds coming together. So that is where internationalization is very, very important. We need to bring now international scholars to teach our students, also have international students to learn on our campuses and interact with other students. That is one thing that that must happen. And uh, and from that point of view, you know, even if you are working on new technologies, there are at least 90 countries or above which have a GDP level below that of India. So whatever technologies we develop for our farmers can as well be used in Africa and other countries. 
so i think our students that way will develop the global outlook our startups will have international markets i think the one thing which we have missed out in a significant way is this internationalization and uh, and i i hope as part of the nep that is something that will happen and at iit delhi we are pushing to recruit international faculty we have reached double figures now the double digits in terms of recruitments of international faculty but it is we still have a long way to go and uh, that's on our uh, cards the second uh, point when it comes to unlike minds is people with different attitudes i think when i say people with different attitudes the industry people interacting with academia which is again very very important and they are uh, you know having professors of practice at iit delhi we started something like that where we said people from industries with a deep knowledge of a particular area can they come and teach with us uh, teach our students and can they come and interact with our faculty so we started this professors of practice which again is picking up but it takes some more time to recruit more and more people and uh, so we are looking at at least you know 10% of our faculty being uh, professors of practice and uh, 10% of students being international students that is a target that we have set for ourselves you know when we have 11000 students on the campus i am talking of uh, you know over 1000 international students in the next 2 uh, years and uh, over 100 faculty uh, as professors of practice in the next 2 to 3 years that's our target the third unlike mind i talk about is the disciplines i think people from diverse disciplines interacting with each other we call it multidisciplinary research or interdisciplinary research in all of that we need to now bring people out of their comfort zones and make them interact with people outside of their domains because product of uh, the problems don't have a discipline when you talk about solving the air quality or farmers doubling the farmers income they don't fall under one discipline multiple disciplines need to come and work together as uh, i was also listening to the discussion so the, even if you talk in terms of technology you know technology today is either beautiful or invisible so that the technology part of it engineers can do but the beautiful part of the engineering the technologies that we have today whether it is consumer products like mobile phones or anything else that requires people with completely different skill sets you know people with lot of creativity to work with engineers to design these products that is where at iit delhi we started a department of design and for the first time this year we will be admitting students who are outside the je advanced kind of an examination we will be admitting students who do not you know come through the mass physics chemistry kind of uh, skills but rather people with creative skills who will come to into the campus interact with engineers and we are also recruiting faculty now you know who have who don't have engineering degrees in the department of design who are basically the creative artists and they are the people we want them to mingle with our technologies so that they can design the the future electronic products consumer electronics so i think the diversity is very important bringing these unlike minds is very important internationalization plays a very large role in in achieving this kind of an outcome thank you very much thank you so much so uh, we strongly agree to the uh, upcoming mode of education and the way we are going towards creativity and the input where we would love to incorporate diversity to add and enhance the level of education and the goals to reach to the desired targets uh, to go to go forward on this uh, i would request dr hari krishnan to come forward and express his views please dr hari krishnan maram yes good morning friends uh, it's wonderful to connect uh, each one of uh, esteemed panel and uh, wonderful to see my friend uh, dr captain here uh, moderating the session i think exactly uh, one year back uh, uh, i was at uh, their campus in uh, malaysia so i can see a wonderful uh, initiatives of captain uh, doing a great job in malaysia a small uh, corner of the world uh, doing uh, wonderful initiatives and uh, thanks pranav for bringing me here and uh, definitely i think uh, i would like to share uh, one of the very interesting uh, report which uh, just published uh, two days back uh, from goldman sachs so this report says today uh, when we talk about uh, the online education because of the pandemic so we have closely 1.5 billion students from primary to phd is online so what the prediction says so currently we have 
closely 9 million students, they are in the paid version of learning. Uh, if you combine all the Coursera, Khan Academy, or whatever uh, online platforms today available across the world. And today, if you look at the registered users, uh, that is closely around 32 million uh, who registered, but they are not paid. And I think COVID given a, a great opportunity to technology because the technology is the only way uh, today we are able to connect uh, with all the stakeholders, whether it is the faculty or students or anyone. So 340 million students uh, today in India itself are connected with online uh, from across the thousand universities or 49,000 colleges or 9,90,000 primary schools, whatever number it is. So 340 million students are able to attend these online classes, whether using mobile or laptop or different ways of uh, platforms. So what Goldman Sachs says by 2025, that means in the next four years, we will be reaching 55 million paid subscribers, paid students who are going to learn a different uh, you know, programs, whether it is a short term or a long term or degree programs, whatever it is. And also this prediction says 140 million students in India, I'm talking about only in India, 140 million students will register and learn at different platforms. That means there are probable buyers of different courses. So then 2025, we will be reaching 400 million students attending online or reaching into a online platforms. So that gives an, a very, very interesting um, theory how the technology is moving forward. When I was just listening to uh, Professor Pant, how uh, the revolution of uh, you know uh, the, the the computer uh, started in India. Uh, so the same way uh, today, I think uh, the 25 years of journey of mobile technology is really given a, a great revolution across the world. So today, uh, without mobile, I think uh, the survival itself becoming very difficult for everyone, uh, even including the common man. So today we are so much addicted to uh, the mobile technology. I think uh, the future is uh, mobile technology in the next 15 to 20 years. I think there are so many new things are coming up, but uh, I don't think uh, nothing can replace uh, with the, uh, the mobile technology, how um, the connectivity and how reachability, affordability, these are the most important factors which are able to connect across the world. And now I think we keep hearing about the 5G technology, uh, how fast the 5G technology is going to come into this world. And there are a couple of news that the 5G technology will come initially uh, to countries like India. So and I think definitely that is going to give a lot of edge compared than um, any other country in this world to India, because the way the bandwidth, the way we connect, the way we deliver, uh, will definitely become, um, you know, uh, a great faster than what we are right now. Also, I just uh, uh, would like to share one more interesting piece of news which just appeared um, two days back uh, by uh, the quote uh, from the Canada Prime Minister, uh, Ms. Justin. Uh, what he quotes is, uh, during this pandemic, the biggest saver uh, of this COVID of this world is India. So he was talking about uh, how effectively we controlled the pandemic, how effectively we are able to supply the vaccine uh, with just two companies uh, in India, the Serum and uh, Bharat Biotech, uh, able to supply to more than 60, 65 countries. And in a six months time, they are ready to give the uh, vaccine dose for the half of the population. Out of the 7.5 billion people, uh, these two companies are ready to supply up to uh, uh, yeah, 3 billion doses to this entire world. So that definitely shows uh, the power of India, the knowledge of India. And today we are talking about the 5 trillion economy uh, 
uh, moving from uh, 3 trillion in next 5 years i think definitely uh, whatever uh, uh, this uh, pandemic effect is affected on the economy but things are moving uh, faster i think uh, the the hope of a new budget the hope of so many other new things which are coming to india will definitely make india as a superpower in coming years with the with the knowledge economy what we have uh, so uh, to conclude uh, my uh, opinion uh, i think um, with niti ayog and uh, the california state university we are working on a, a, a very uh, special initiative called gdk this is a new term uh, which just brought to only india only to india because every country economy we calculate on gdp so there is a professor called professor umberto salpaso who is a senior uh, fellow uh, in california state university and he heads the digital future uh, division in california so uh, this professor brought a new theory called gdkp what he did is he added k k factor into the gdp the k factor is nothing but knowledge he says if the knowledge is stronger in any country then economy also will be stronger so how to build knowledge on people a country like india with the 1.38 billion people how you can identify what knowledge is required what skills are required so this is a work uh, this professor going to initiate within a few days i think uh, uh, we are happy to share that we associated in this project to do in a bigger way to reach to all the uh, academic leaders like you and uh, definitely in a few days time i'll be coming back uh, with uh, with uh, all the report of this gdkp and how we can work together and definitely this um, report is going to be a very exclusive for only in india for the next 5 years so that can definitely improve our skills definitely can improve our youth what we say the demographic dividend of 60% of the youth below 35 age is going to get maximum benefit out of this gdkp initiative where the central government already put a budget and central government already taken initiative to launch this program across india through educational institutions so that's all from my side the captain thank you very much and wonderful to see you again all my friends here thank you thank you dr hari i have heard him on a number of occasions he is a data driven man and uh, the way he expresses uh, his views on data and proves it that is tremendous and certainly we would love to take your concluding words that is k factor and we are doing the brainstorming on education 3 to 1 with the k factor it's actually going to go in a big way taking it forward i will now request uh, mr tarun anand to come forward and express his views he's from universal business school kajrat mumbai and uh, he's the find founder of this business school sir over to you uh thank you very much uh, it was amazing to hear mr pant uh, i welcome this uh, initiative i think it fits uh clearly in something i read recently about uh, you know the ceo of amba association of mbas um professor andrew uh, wilson the business school uh you know has to incorporate three elements one is embracing digital revolution which is exactly what you're talking about so it's in sync uh, the whole blended version of learning uh, is has to be part of the program uh also the other important thing he mentioned was the internationalization and and i welcome you know we have colleagues from uh, all over the uh, globe on this panel so uh, clearly that shows that the future is for us uh, students to navigate cultures and the challenges that these cultures face uh and the final thing he says is that it has to be affordable education has to be the value of the program uh, students post covid are going to look at the roi so i absolutely welcome this idea and uh, you know interested how the community will look forward uh, just make one point uh, reference on the uh, discussion with professor kamlesh which i thought was very interesting you know i i agree with professor pant that the left brain is going to be taken over right the left brain activities has to and should be taken over by the ai machines it's where the right brain so we are saying the human being is the left and the right the right brain is where the compassion the empathy the creativity all of that is going to be accelerated we don't use that we get all our time spent 
doing menial tasks in the left brain, if we can free that, put all the energy, and that's what will make human beings very, very unique and ahead of machines and uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, is the right brain. So we need to put all our energies in the right brain, and that's how we will progress humankind. That's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Wonderfully brought out. I was just trying to conclude what you are saying is that in other words, we can enslave the technology and become a better leader uh, and that to be leader in the field of education. So thank you so much. Uh, right now, uh, there are no hands raised I can see, but I can see one name, Dr. Kuldeep Singh from Ames, Jodhpur. So I request, sir, uh, please come forward and speak. Uh, Amit, sir, I'll uh, call you after this now. I just saw your hand. So, Dr. Kuldeep, please. Thank you, Dr. Janisha, and very wonderful listening to Professor Pant about uh, the task shifting which the automation can do, including the chatbots. At Ames Jodhpur, as a medical uh, physician, as a medical educationist, uh, we are seeing a lot of things in the change in the education. What we want is the lifelong learners, but we are just uh, basing our uh, knowledge only on the Miller's lower triangle, that is the, that is the knowledge base. We never shows a student how to do, show how, or show to that world. So that's why there is a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, we are talking about the lectures, theater without walls. The boundaries, there's a, no, no boundary for the learning. So the online, the COVID time has created so much opportunity. And in fact, uh, uh, when we talk about the COVID, nobody was knowing about the COVID. Now everybody, even a child knows, a three-year-old know, child knows about what is COVID. And even the people are talking about the genomics when they don't understand what is the genes are. So, uh, so much uh, knowledge has expanded. And, but the most important thing which is there in uh, our education is the moral values. And uh, that's why the humanistic education can only be possible if we just concentrate more on the human values and the moral values, because the knowledge is going to come later on. Uh, any, anyway, you are going to get more knowledge as you progress. So even the COVID time was in fact a social experiment and uh, the effects of this social experiment will come in the next three or four years. When the mobile was devised, nobody was knowing that how it can impact the human health. But now we are seeing the side effects of the mobile phone and there is impending civil war, which is because of the social media. So uh, social media, we experiment on a very basic level about these new educational technologies, but we never think about the future of these how the future is going to be there in 10 or 15 years, how the life will be different, what are the different disease can come. Now we are facing the disease spectrum is changing. We are not, not low, no, no longer seeing the patients with the infectious disease or the nutritional disorders. We are more seeing with the sleep disorders, uh, mental problems, social problems, these are coming up. So that's why when we are talking about the education for the coming century, uh, we have to, task shifting should be done with the help of automation, uh, AI will definitely help, but the clinician's mind cannot be replaced by the AI because the clinicians, if they think about a physician, if they think about a human being, they thought of so many thousands and hundreds of things that they can decrease the cost of the treatment, which the AI will incur. So because the AI will give a, a, a condition, there are 20 conditions which need to be diagnosed. So the people will go for the 20 conditions testing, but the clinician who is aware of all these things will bring it down to only two or three conditions for which the investigation may be required. So that's why our education should be more focused on the higher level cognitive decision making and with the, with the values or moral values and the human values in the mind. If we can inculcate those values, the knowledge are automatically going to come. There is no uh, there is no boundary for the acquiring the knowledge. So I very, very well agree with uh, uh, Professor Kamlesh also and Dr. Pant and all the speakers. They have spoken very well on this topic. But from the medical perspective, these are my views. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Certainly, uh, the thought process changes, the science changes, and accordingly, our body adapts or does not adapt to the system and uh, that's how the uh, diseases come and uh, that was doctor's perspective so now uh, taking this forward uh, i would uh, like to request uh, uh, mr jamshed to come forward and uh, express his views thank you very much um, i'm a cognitive neuroscientist 
And so I approach education reform from that point of view. Uh, we ha Cognitive science and neuroscience have been very slow to come to India. Uh, we are launching a university in Chennai called Sai University, which will be uh, announced uh, in a few weeks. Um, and the pedagogical design really is based on research from cognitive neuroscience on how the brain learns. When we talk about education and learning, uh, everybody has an opinion. I think we all know as educators, everybody has an opinion and everybody is absolutely certain that they're correct about it. <clears throat> um, but we do actually have the f foundation of a field, the science of learning. And I think uh, we should all start to think about the brains of our students and how we develop those brains. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Punt. Uh, in personalized learning. No two brains are identical. There are a lot of uh, commonalities across brains, but no two brains are identical, and it is our job uh, at, when we design education systems to figure out how we can uh, fully realize the potential of every single uh, brain. Uh, and I think uh, one thing I'll just, I know we're short of time, uh, of the many things that we know about uh, the brain and cognition is that after millions of years of evolution, uh, it has an agenda. The child uh, directs its learning of language. Uh, we don't teach language to our children. Uh, they come biologically wired to explore their environment, to explore their linguistic environment, to ask questions, to observe, to test the environment, to test hypotheses. And the purpose, whether it's formal education or the kind of informal education children receive in the first five years of life at home, is to provide an enriching environment in which this exploration can occur and the feedback uh, is given. Um, so instead of deciding what students should know, we need to change the emphasis to providing an ecosystem in which students can explore their environment according to their own interests and passions uh, and are given the kind of uh, response that enables them uh, to grow whatever particular talents they may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, certainly, uh, we work as far as education system is concerned that we are designing curriculum, we are designing techniques of learning, but yes, there is a time, this is a time rather when we uh, move towards science of learning and we move and adopt such systems where the learning occurs rather than be creating the system and environment of learning. So uh, thank you so much, sir, for your views. Uh, I take this forward. Dr. Amit raised hand that time when I was calling the previous speaker. So over to you, Dr. Amit. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Captain Tanisha. Uh, uh, it's such a pleasure to be part of this, uh, this conference. And uh, I've been carefully going through all uh, all the things that our esteemed panelists have been saying. Uh, Professor Pant uh, made a point that, you know, uh, community, uh, the community has to come forward and uh, do things as opposed to waiting for government and maybe private sector. I think that's a very good point. Uh, one of the things, you know, the themes of the seminar was that, uh, uh, how do we build skills for the future? How do we disseminate uh, those, uh, you know, competencies? Uh, which are uh, which make uh, people future ready. So uh, uh, I, I just want to talk about that theme. And uh, uh, most universities uh, uh, think of their job as uh, imparting education to students. So uh, I want to uh, propose a slightly different viewpoint that yeah, student is our target audience, no doubt about it. 
But um, what about the corporate sector? We have been receiving a number of requests from the corporate sector uh, telling us that, you know, we know that we need to reskill for the future. We need to build competencies for the future. So uh, uh, can you help us do that? So uh, a large number of companies are really worrying whether uh, they'll become obsolete in the next 10 years and what is it that they need to do to uh, climb up the ladder and then uh, you know, uh, introduce the new competencies that would be required in the future, uh, which uh, if they don't do that, they would become obsolete and you know, the companies would uh, fall behind. So uh, I think one of, we need, as universities, we need to look at the corporate sector as a very, very important uh, you know, target audience so, uh, so we need to, uh, you know, develop the, the competencies to be able to guide a company, a large company comes to me, uh, maybe 10,000 crore company comes to me and says, look, we need to have, we need to reskill our people, we need to introduce new technologies, we need to be future proof, uh, can you help us do that? Uh, so when we look around, we find that, you know, we have not built those skills. We are able to teach students, we are able to disseminate certain kind of information and knowledge. But if, if, a, if a company comes to me and says that, can you help me, can you hold my hand and uh, help me take this forward? Uh, I find that I don't have the bandwidth. So I'm sure that this is probably true of many of the universities. I was just wondering whether, you know, we can form a community, uh, which uh, Professor Pant proposed, uh, maybe a bunch of universities coming together and then trying to pool our resources and our capabilities, and then uh, try to see if we can guide uh, a large corporate to take this forward. And uh, you know, in the note that has been circulated by EDUTV, uh, we have something that is level four and level five, which deals with serious professionals and people who are already well into their careers. So I'm referring to uh, that part uh, of, the, of the proposal, uh, level four and level five, so uh, do you think, I, I'm just throwing this open to the panel here, uh, do you think it is worthwhile uh, for some of the universities here uh, to collaborate and uh, you know, see if we can guide a large corporate, uh, find a way through this very, very complex uh, uh, issue. Uh, I know many top management, many boards of governors uh, of companies, uh, you know, uh, what keeps them awake is the thought that are we becoming obsolete? Do we have the skills for the future? And when they come to us, uh, do we have a really good response uh, for that? So I just want to leave this question here and I would welcome, uh, you know, uh, if it, EduTV uh, takes an initiative to form a community of that kind, uh, I would be very, very happy sure. to be Sure, sir, sure, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted. So the aim is that only? Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, uh, the purpose of this spark is this only that we uh, understand the purpose and come together for a bigger cause. And certainly the time is going to come when the current jobs will fade away and we need to be ready with competencies to be developed for our students and uh, everyone rather to be future ready. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, before uh, you, somebody raise hand and uh, I don't know it is uh, registered with University Art College of Design and Business. So, may I request you to come forward, sir? Ma'am, ma'am, uh, Ashna. Name was not there. It is university registered on uh, thing. So, uh, Archana, Please, Archana, Archana Right. Thank you so much, ma'am, for having me. And I'm so delighted to hear all the uh, educationists to shape the future of this country. And uh, while we are, and because my experience is in the space of design, and uh, it's been 25 years and uh, exploring design rather I'd say. So I would, uh, uh, where I'm very impressed where uh, Professor Ram Gopal touched upon creativity as being very key and prominent. So we have Dr. Sir, uh, you know, is Ken Robinson. He said, creativity now is, an import is as important in education as literacy and we should treat it with the same status. So I think um, creativity is the key. And uh, if we, anybody wants to drive innovation at any level, I think that multidisciplinary approach can only uh, foster creativity. And that learning environment is what we all need to nurture while we need to look at 
uh, what he very beautifully emphasized that to bring in the international character within an institution, whether it's in the form of faculty or in the form of students being there. I think all international campuses across the globe, that's what they are, that's how they are nurturing creativity because of the kind of interdisciplinary approach that's been brought into the system. And uh, why it's very important is to look at what Professor Pranth emphasized again is, uh, you know, personalized learning. So I think it all starts with observation. And when Jamshed sir, you know, touched upon talking about, you know, how, uh, you know, judgmental we've become in terms of education, you know, the, the whole ability of observation and sensing is somewhere we are losing out on. So while we've been talking about design thinking, we talk about empathizing, but what are you really inferring out of, uh, you know, what is that we are actually sensing? Are we really aware? So is the, our cognitive minds developed enough? And I think uh, while uh, Captain Ma'am is here with us, we've just did these pr pr principles conference with 30 of them and another set of, uh, you know, principles and we were talking about that this needs to be taken much earlier at the school level where creativity is nurtured and personalized learning is encouraged. So it's, uh, I, I truly feel that, you know, um, it all develops first when we start observing, as you said, you know, that language is not being taught. We naturally absorb it from our environment and we connect with things and we make our own connections. So I think the whole ability to be able to sense then the sensing and the sensitivity that we need to develop to be able to develop the ability for it. So that would naturally then probably uh, bring a design ability. And while we talk about design in a very structured manner in terms of Egypt, in terms of empathizing and then ideating and then prototyping and you know testing it out, it's very interesting that uh, you know while these stages can really give some kind of predictable results, but we still need to really see that have we been able to uh, nurture the sensing, the ability to sense. And this is what probably education needs to now look at if we really want to make it personalized. And I think design has a very key role to play. And um, I'm completely uh, in sync with what, uh, you know, uh, Jamchet sir and Professor Pant specifically talked about the personalized learning aspect. And while we've been talking about largely about STEM education and uh, which has moved on to STEAM education, having arts becoming very important. And I was in the US uh, as a part of, I was a team leader uh, on a Rotary Exchange program. And uh, I was meeting one of these professors and said, we get students coming from India and we feel that their understanding towards liberal arts is very, very you know, low. And whether we would, if they're coming from an engineering background or a science background, they're very stuck in their way of thinking uh, in terms of the kind of scientific understanding. So I think somewhere that um, the from the STEM to the STEAM, I think we need to evolve to the STEAM, where we need to build in entrepreneurship and design into our education system. While I talk about entrepreneurship, it's not about, it's about value creation, it's about a mindset, because I am a homegrown entrepreneur. And I realized the importance while I was not taught as a designer, and I've been self-taught and we have, uh, you know, faculty coming from all across the world who teach. We have partnership with University of Antwerp. We have with uh, Parisian schools. The, 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 the whole essence is that, you know, you learn from different cultures. And uh, that, uh, that uh, tolerance in uh, education is very important now. Where, he, where Professor um, uh, Jamshed said, again said that, you know, it's, we've all become so significant about what we know. But are we really able to? observe and see and understand. So I think somewhere education needs to foster this, uh, um, an ecosystem where we can nurture this. And I was very happy when, when Professor Ram Gopal in one of our is, uh, Times of India clippings, uh, one of our, the student applica applica applicants actually shared with us that our entrance exam, which we nurtured 10 years back, was the first online entrance exam in design in the country. And uh, we didn't know, and that has been acknowledged by him on some platform, which has been, uh, you know, put in an article by Times of India that, our, and it is known as EAD. We call it the All India Entrance Examination in Design. And we see to it, and it actually um, examines, uh, you know, screens the creativity quotient of a student, rather than, you know, seeing that, you know, whether you know science or maths, or you have some kind of 
learnings. So it's very, very, my key focus would be to nurture creativity and how can we nurture that environment in our education system, right from the school level to our higher education level. Because while I was talking to the principals, I realized that the school system is very open and adaptive now. And is the higher education system equally open and adaptive to making these new changes? Because we want them so employably, you know, we want them so employable and employability ready so that we are we missing out on nurturing their true creativity because i am an entrepreneur and i sit on various industry and you know forums and with entrepreneurs and like-minded people so i understand that you know there's a constant quest that an entrepreneur goes to in terms of learning and learning which sir emphasized upon you know uh, you know learning uh, and learning and then relearning so i'd like to it's I'm, I'm really glad that i'm a part of this forum getting to hear such amazing uh, you know thought thoughts that are emerging and i think this kind of this kind of conversation is going to really lead some new pathways in terms of what this 21st century especially this third decade can bring forth so thank you so much thank you archana ma'am uh, you have summed it up in your big sentence which you started with uh, when you, you started with your talk that creativity is as important as literacy and from stem to stream and stream to stream yes the journey has begun and we have started thinking on those lines where we give importance to uh, the thought process which leads to entrepreneurship and also to design thinking taking this forward further may i request dr mahboob from defodil university bangladesh to come forward and express his views Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to attend this important and prestigious roundtable discussion. I am very much delighted, and I am happy to see all these learned persons here. But I do not know much about the Indian um, education or something like. But I know something, but uh, not fully. So I will speak uh, in common, uh, commonly, uh, about uh, this uh, issue. Well, I like to say that the world has changed, so we have to change with the change of the world. That means we have to go for fruitful technology, which should be environmental friendly. Without technology and innovative research, we cannot progress much. So attention should be given for innovative research. The research should be for the well-being of the human beings. The example is that the COVID-19, we, 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 we are able to uh, the bring the COVID vaccine. So this is the beauty of the technology and the innovative knowledge, innovative research. So we, without technology at the moment or in future, we cannot move even an inch. So we should. Uh, give priority about the uh, technology. So for future education system, we have to change with the change which I mentioned earlier. Better thinking, better future is absolutely necessary. Technology-driven education is absolutely essential for the, uh, to meet the future challenge. To attain the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, machine learning and robotics, drones, etc., etc. They are the key uh, player for the uh, innovative uh, idea and research and to implement the technology. So technology-based solutions are needed for the next education system. So, and at the same time, we have to uh, bring a change in the curricula in the assessment process, as well as the examination system, and all these things should be driven by technology. Because today, if, if I find my mobile is okay, but in the evening, I, I will find that this is not okay because some change has already come in to this thing. So technology is moving very faster and we have to adapt with this technology. And if we adapt technology in our next education system, I think we will be able to, to reach our goal. Uh, and uh, and uh, today, the students are very innovative. If we can give them proper feeding, 
I think we will be able to reach uh, in a very better way and our education system will also be enhanced. So with these few words, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, your thoughts strengthen the thought uh, prof, uh, process which was brought forward by uh, Professor Pant and few other speakers that technology is the need of the hour as far as exactly. the learning process is concerned and you added value to it by saying that inspiring thoughts lead to aspiring future and certainly uh, the entire system rather ecosystem of education is taking this journey forward. Once again thank you so much. Uh, a yes. little while ago Mr. Bhatia, Rahul Bhatia raised hand so may I request Mr. Bhatia to come forward. Forum is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Captain Zanisha. Uh, first of all, thank you, Radio uh, TV, for uh, making me a part of this forum. I have been following uh, Professor Pan for many years. Uh, he might not remember me, but. Uh, no, no, I remember you. <laughs> but, I remember uh, right, right from uh, his startup, Platinum Edu to Planet Edu. I have been interacting and I have been seeing the way he's been uh, uh, doing and he's been bringing in changes in his own way. Uh, I completely agree with Professor Pan uh, in terms of how uh, one can bring in smaller programs with a group of universities and have a system of badges and credits in place which allows you to move and you know, uh, move as and then keep on learning. We come from that space, though of course I've been associated with many universities, I've helped in uh, setting up of uh, uh, the enrollment processes for many universities. So I come from the other side. So, uh, and what we have also realized as Professor Pant had said, that a lot of linear jobs need to be technology driven so that the thought process of academia can be uh, focused elsewhere. And to the same, we've been doing uh, you know, those small interfaces. We have products like Chronon software, uh, wherein we have artificially intelligent uh, softwares, which allow you to generate question papers uh, and you know, uh, make uh, large amounts of question papers and banks, and we use AI in that. Similarly, a uh, uh, new product of ours, the scholarships, uh, they .com, which also uses AI to help universities and colleges find the right set of students. Because the idea is that, yes, we do have uh, products and services. How do we reach the masses and get the large number of uh, 12.8 million, to be uh, precise, of students who come into the system year on year basis? And biggest difficulty is how to reach them. And yes, agreed, uh, Mr. Pant, uh, that uh, EdTest system has to be followed for one to look at what kind of credits can be uh, done. We have been following up and we've been doing some work uh, with a Korean uh, uh, AI organization called Read Labs. We're trying to do uh, some work in terms of test prep. We are launching our product in Delhi uh, very soon. So yes, I am from that space wherein I do not understand AI as such, but I am at, I'm, I'm a bridge wherein I understand what the requirement of academia is. And I also know what all is available in terms of uh, uh, off the shelf or frames from the uh, industry. So bringing them together is something which is needed to uh, make sure that your vision is taken forward. So that's my thought process. And uh, Thank you very much for uh, having me in this room. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, your presence is strengthening the uh, process which is uh, actually a kind of a, uh, been brought out by uh, Professor Pant as his brainchild. So uh, thanks for your views and uh, inputs. Uh, now taking it forward, uh, I would like to invite a gentleman uh, who uh, has created a space in Limka Book of World Records. Uh, he is none other than uh, Mr. Amol Arora, who has been, uh, you know, uh, surprising entrepreneur and educationist. Uh, and uh, he registered in uh, Limka Book of World Record by creating, uh, you know, by opening one school every week, which which sounds really amazing. And he is the MD of uh, Shemrock and Shemford Schools. Sir, the forum is yours. Yes, 
thank you ma'am thank you for that and uh, it's an honor to be here and um, what i do appreciate is among all people of higher education there's somebody from the early childhood somebody with a focus on early childhood education and somebody on with a focus on school education because we set the the stage for what students enter uh, to your segment and obviously we get the complaints that it's a school sector which is uh, not sending the right kind of students and by the time the children reach a higher education talk about 21st century learning and all seems a far cry because where we are people uh, when i go to colleges i hear the same things as students are still struggling with the basics of speaking english with just the looking very sharp the very short sighted approach of looking for their next job most of them are not even basic employable so should we focus on 21st century skills or even uh, business skills entrepreneurial skills or should we just talk to them about learning english so i think uh, the challenge is that uh, and sometimes the solutions that we all offer in terms of building capacity for the future learning le learning unlearning relearning is is a far cry when you people who are students who have their vision set at a very uh, low risk uh, career ahead so i've seen that uh, in india and, and and that's a problem in with indians all of us we try to go for a safe option we are still stuck in the same uh, medical engineering uh, get a job kind of a degree and although i i keep telling students that you know now with the bpo sector you basically have a social security network in front of you you're not going to remain hungry if you can if you're willing to put in the efforts you will get a 20000 rupees job anywhere in india so with that why aren't you taking risk but i still see uh, everybody still looking at who's are as it, it reminds me and, and that's the same thing which was there i think uh, when i was in uh, delhi college of engineering and the placement director came on stage and was talking about this much salary and ooh ah so we're going out wow you know and and he got so upset as upset the person who had come as our um, external person he was one of our alumni he was he just he was fuming in his speech he said what are you guys thinking about day lucky naukri ke liye you are thinking about as if ki pata nahi kya ho gaya you know if you guys can't think big then who else is going to think big and i think that's a common problem that we have our mindset is still set on uh, very short term goals and that's a problem with parents as well and the problem with students as well and as far as school, schools i mean i would love to have schools which uh, where we teach all these things and we are able to do that but the problem starts coming in the um higher classes higher classes is everybody starts becoming very narrow short term focused and it's all the same so it starts with more creativity at the younger age and as you're supposed to fit into the system by class 8 9 10 11 12 12th, everybody starts going very focused on that class 12th marks now and you're supposed to stop everything stop all creativity ha 8 to karna tha kar liya ab aap serious ho jao what do you mean by serious ho jao mean so we all do that all our our websites talk about all round development every school website talks about all round development but there is all round development in class 7th 8th and by the time you are supposed to become a conformist right? for non conformist there is no space in the school sector because everyone's focus on the entrance examination everyone's focus on the class 12th examination so as long as the questions remain the same those exam systems the behavior of teachers and students will also remains the same So when you ask students to think long term, parents to think long term, they cannot think long term. Even today, when COVID was there, which students were coming? Class twelve students. Why? Because they had to give the exam. What about others? Are ठीक है हो जाएगा पहले बाद में देख लेंगे. So I think the bigger problem that we are all facing is the class twelve examination. We need a better system to evaluate uh, students. A better system to do the matchmaking between what a student is and which course or university he or she is. uh is suitable for what kind of career uh, they are suitable for considering the numbers of people we have in india it's a humongous task i see uh, people like dr pant should be the only solution for this where they find out some way of using artificial intelligence to try and do that combined with more human interactions where that communication gap is so big it's almost still we are still the same rut where good marks automatically means science in the lok kya sochenge science means me engineering medical if you can't go there then you go into something else it's just a pathetic way of teaching our children and people end up learning skills which they never use they're not passionate about it uh, i mean uh, if, if 20 people can create or 27 people can create a, an application like whatsapp and a company with lakhs of employees like tcs cannot create one decent application till now that just reflects on the kind of talent passion It's a complete mismatch right now, and that is what the problem is. And 
by the time the person starts thinking about what makes me happy, what am I going to be happy, what are my skills, what am I passionate about, he or she is married and has a responsibility, has an EMI to pay, and then they'll get stuck in that career for the, for the rest of life. So this is the problem that's going on. And they, so very few Indians are able to actually, uh, you know, utilize their potential. We have our own strengths. We have very strong work ethics. We are very good learners. We are very good students. We are very passionate of employees as well. We are excellent as Indians. But the problem is it's a complete mismatch. And by the time a person is 35 and he has two kids, things that, okay, this is what I want to do, it's too late. He's already, he's already caught in that web of uh, EMIs and payments. So where does, how do you form that solution? I think the only way is we sort out the class 12th examination and the colleges also should look at some other way of assessments. Yes, we've tried interviews, we've tried group discussions, but there has to be something where technology has to do that matchmaking. And until that, we are in school, we are damaging our students beyond repair. Parents are responsible for this, schools are responsible for this, because every school, what do they do in the May? They take out the advertisement. This is my toppers, 99.6, 99.7. These are my toppers. Because if that is how you're going to reward a teacher, saying, see, out of 40 students, you got so many A pluses and so many A's. So teachers also focus just on the on the grades. And you're so grade focused, which are meaningless today. When I'm hiring, I don't even look at their grades of somebody. But unfortunately, that focus from 8th onwards to 12th, uh, students who are in sixth now are going for pre-IIT coaching from class six. I mean, he, where is his, his, he's lost his entire childhood uh, sitting, being cramming in, in these classes. All their all-down development skills, which have would have helped, they would have helped them in their workplace to live happier lives as professionals in their personal lives. Those skills would never got a chance to be developed. They were told to with that same thought. Ki agar wo I mean, that's the thought that you have to, the collaboration and all things are out of the window. You focus on your thing. It's your marks that matter. It's your career. I think mean, that is what the, that 8th to 12th class is what I think is really ha hampering. And by the time they go out of there, it's too late. And then in colleges... I, re I resonate with you, sir. In schools, absolutely what you are saying is everybody is facing. And uh, uh, certainly to some extent, the journey has begun. We started thinking about innovation and creativity. We have started thinking of uh, new methods of learning. NEP 2020 also brings in some changes which we are expecting to come in a big way. And I'm sure uh, the things will move in a positive direction where the gap is bridged nicely. Thank you so much for your wonderful views and true insight, uh, which actually comes from the school level of education, starting from K1 to uh, 12th level and especially from uh, sixth onwards. So uh, going in the same vein, uh, now I request uh, 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 Professor Ranjit Singh of uh, Shobit University. So thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, it was uh, wonderful to listen to all the eminent personalities and especially Professor Pant who uh, gave such a nice opening to this uh, discussion and uh, uh, it was just eye-opener for me and uh, so many uh, uh, facts, truths were revealed by him and what I could get from all the discussions from all learned uh, personalities here that uh, yes, uh, we have to change, that is the first thing and what Professor Pant raised the point to re-educate, to reskill uh, those who are already graduates uh, from our universities or colleges and for that, the kind of infrastructure that we need, uh, we have to identify that. And uh, the community learning, uh, which was emphasized by Professor Pant, I uh, fully agree with him. Now, what I feel right now is that how to do it, that is very important, how to do it. Uh, and uh, what role of university can play, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Amit Bhadra also, that uh, how we can collaborate. And uh, many things which, were, uh, which are mentioned by all these learned personalities, including Amolji right now, I think uh, national education policy have all the provisions and in next uh, five to 10 years, we will be seeing much changes there. And we are talking about this third decade of 21st century. Uh, we have to adopt to the technology, connectivity and technology, the right use of technology. I agree that uh, when such things come there, then use, misuse uh, is there parallelly. But yes, we are all like-minded people and we have to go for positive use. So here, what I want to say, uh, say here that uh, EduTV has to play a role again as a coordinator, as a, a center point where uh, we can uh, think of collaborations to uh, make these dreams true, what uh, Professor Pant has proposed. 
I can only say that uh, we have to check uh, the realities also, the infrastructure available, the workforce, the manpower available with us, and the skill level. Because uh, uh, learning, uh, the, the uh, things are changing, how education is changing, what radical change is needed there, how we, um, you see, uh, gain knowledge from resources, now we have to convert uh, uh, resources, uh, to gain knowledge from the resources and then to convert knowledge into the resources. That's what we need in the next 10 years. Uh, I can, from Shovit University, I am uh, in a university which is totally in the rural background and uh, we have different kinds of students with us. They are all talented, there's no doubt. But yes, uh, we have to provide them uh, with that platform, whether it is technology or the connect, human connect, so that they get those skills which are required in next five years or next 10 years. Uh, from our university, I, I can only say that we are ready for all kinds of association and collaborations, and we are ready to uh, pool the resources. That I can say, and I wish all the best to all the eminent personalities here and to the Edu, Edu TV. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be a part of such, uh, such a great gathering. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. We were discussing of, about uh, what part of uh, enhancement in uh, teaching, learning and uh, education is required. And uh, wonderfully, you brought out how part of it as to how to do it and how to take it forward, because actually the thought process should come to reality. And that's how the minds are uh, interacting with each other to move to the actual ground level uh, reality to come through and uh, that's how we will actually transform the entire system once again thank you so much uh, taking it further forward i'll request now uh, dr abhay kumar vice chancellor of pratap university to share his views uh, thank you captain dinesha uh, my my sincere thanks to edu tv and uh, professor fun especially for bringing this uh, wonderful topic on for in fact uh, uh, I would just like to put forward for a few minutes that with the advent of industry four and subsequently the technology which has come, that is AI, IoT, then we have AR, VR, and we can make a good list of that. What has happened is that uh, education four now has come into being. We must understand that technology is here. Whenever uh, there's a change in technology in the past decades, we see that there is resistance. Even today, any change which you bring about, there is initial resistance, but then we have to acclimatize and accept that. How? When we know that teachers, we are talking about becoming facilitators. We are not going to teach them. We have to create self-learners. This is what we are talking about today. And this is what learning three to one is. Self-learning by the students, because the students who are in the school right now, in the next decade, either they would come to a college or university or go for a job. As somebody just pointed out, with a specific skill set, they can well climb the corporate ladder. But then it is a corporate maze as of now. It's not a ladder anymore. Because the skills keep on changing. You have to update, upgrade your skills continuously in that process. Uh, let me just put forward a very basic point uh, how many of the students actually know how to use a mobile for learning? This is this is one point I would like to put to uh, put forth before all the learned vice chancellors, uh, professors, and everyone. The use of a mobile handset for learning is still not in that um, say condition in which it should have been. Like pro probably Professor Pant also has been doing a yeoman's work on. Uh, WhatsApp mobile and for lifelong learning, sir, if I am right. Yes. Uh, so, so what, what, what exactly we have to do? We have to somehow, as somebody said, put AI do the menial tasks. But sir, allow me to submit that I somewhat agree with Professor Kamlesh Mishraji also, that let's not forget ourselves how to do that menial task in the future. Let's not technology take over. Let's, let's Get, take the assistance of technology in doing whatever we are. So, so, so the submission again would be uh, like for instance, uh, Mr. Amol Arora has very well put forward and I must congratulate him for coming in the Limka book of records. I had visited his school once when I was in DLF Valley Panchkula. So I just went ahead. I was vice chancellor in one of the universities at that point of time. So, so I would say that he has been, of course, 
uh, giving the best inputs to the children. But then again, a mismatch. Means as Ajna Man said, and as Amoji said, sometimes the students from the schools are not the correct input for higher education institutions. This is what I have just heard. Sometimes it is felt that the higher educational institutions are not doing what they should have done. So this mismatch again is uh, in the context of cohesiveness, which Professor Pung talked about earlier. That means, are we using the education methodology for those who are actually uh, having the best facilities? Is the education uh, directed towards them? Or is the education directed towards the masses? We have to build a cohesiveness. In organizations like where I am at Pratap University, I'll tell you, we have international students also. We have uh, students from the, the rural areas. We have students from uh, say suburbs and cities, and even from metropolises. So when it becomes such cohesiveness, we have to fight it out in terms of teaching them or in making them self-learners. It is different with different category of students. They come from different cultural backgrounds. They come from different race, caste, creed, whatever it may be. From Nigeria, it is different how to deal with them. So we as educators must understand that as teachers, if I consider myself to be a teacher, I must say, and a man of having a background of management also, I must say that we have to choose the students differently when we are giving different inputs to them, even in terms of technology. Every technology would not be suited to every student. This is what I personally also feel. So I think I would leave at that. There are a few more speakers left. So thank you once again, Professor Pan Edu TV, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. The arena is very vast, and the analysis has to be done at every level. Yes, we do agree that uh, uh, technology also has to be chosen according to the acumen and aptitude and the requirement to fulfill the best inputs and output to come forward. And simultaneously, uh, menial jobs, uh, whatever we say, have to be given so that uh, the technology can be enslaved. But certainly, whatever we give, we should also master whatever we are giving to uh, take the output in a better way so that whenever there is a requirement, the roles can be switched. Thank you once again, sir. Now I request Mr. Sandeepan Reddy to share his views on the uh, topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eddie TV, for this uh, wonderful session. These are all eminent uh, persons. I'm just a uh, new to this entire industry, working in the entire uh, rural part of Maharashtra. So uh, what, uh, what I could agree, I could agree with each and everyone with all the points. And that, that's the basic difference I could understand after doing my engineering, MBAs, working in the corporates and now into education industry. The only difference why I would say if it is connect, uh, uh, it is uh, in the NEP that the schools, the schools are left out uh, and they don't have any uh, collaboration with the universities where research has to be done backwards also. Like most of the eminent persons that it, it has to have, we should them young rather than because most of the, uh, what I interact with a lot of people and they say, whatever the course is, the, the, the entire education is not being by choice, but by default. And how, if at all, we could really focus on how, how uh, students can really choose what they really want to do in life. So uh, I wouldn't go much because these are very, uh, I, I'm learning a lot uh, from the morning sessions and I'll, I'll keep on learning. So thank you very much uh, for, for everyone uh, for uh, allowing me to uh, uh, have my few words. And I would love to hear more from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. Uh, we have already uh, shot the time beyond the limits. I would now request, uh, and thanks for your uh, candid views. Anyone wants to contribute anything, any point left? Okay. Yes, Professor Pant. So I think uh, I'm very delighted because the contributions have been very useful very appropriate. It looks like most people are keen to take this forward. It is also an appropriate time for me to dispel some myths. Because what is happening is we are seeing technology as some strange invader. That is not so. All of us are using technology. When Captain 
is using her glasses to see, she's using technology. If we take the glasses out, she can't do. Now treat AI must like the same, that you can wear it when you want and you can take it away when you want. Why are you seeing AI as something which is conquering you or overpowering you, etc.? So the metaphor which I just now coined, and of course I've been wearing glasses since I was in school, this is the appropriate metaphor. You take it on when it helps you, and you take it out when you don't need it. So that one. The other important point that I want to emphasize, because many people uh, have not understood what is happening. Let me tell you, this can scare you or comfort you. Uh, we had very good contributions from the Sai University Vice Chancellor, who's the neuroscientist himself. We still were thinking of us versus something else. There is no such thing, whatever, <laughs> when we look at our you know, left brain, right brain, and we're saying our thoughts, and stuff, all our thoughts, et cetera, are all because of the chemistry in the system. There is nothing external. See, there was a time when we used to talk of, you know, a life force as something else. And I'm getting a pran zaidiya, pran nikaliya, all this. You know, it is nothing. It is just a complex organization. When it ceases to work, there are 40 trillion cells. If they cease to work together, it is the end of story. There is no such thing giving you a life force. In fact, there's a whole field called abiogenesis from where we saw from how from non-living things we made living things. Then we saw Darwin's evolution. And over billions of years, millions of years, we acquired all these things. Everything that we can do can be done by stimulation. Now, for example, why is doping considered bad for athletes? He takes some drugs and can do it much better. We are saying, no, let it be limited to the drugs that body produces on its own. So the point is that the knowledge of science, and I mentioned this a little bit, that now we have come to a stage where we understand nature to a level that we can decide. In fact, we did this so just now in one year's time, we mapped the virus, et cetera, so various variations, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Now, if the technology hadn't been there, you wouldn't have, it would take you another 50 years before you would have understood what to hit you. In fact, you would have called it some mata, et cetera, and doing some puja for it and so on and so forth. Now, let me explain, uh, and this is very important for us to appreciate. When artificial intelligence, see, in fact, the name artificial intelligence is a problem. Because of that name, we assume so many things which we assume with intelligence. It is not artificial intelligence. There is no intelligence in it. It is a set of prediction mechanism for some set of data. In fact, the field of artificial intelligence began almost 60 years ago. And at that time, they thought that humans have certain rules for processing things. So an experienced doctor, lawyer, engineer has something called heuristics, which he uses. And they were trying to make the computer carry out those rules. And they were called uh, rule-based expert systems. Later on, they came up to realize as computers became more powerful, why not just look at the data and see what patterns we deduce? And now what has happened is, and I will quickly try to tell you because take medicine, for example, there was certain reluctance about the understanding. A very well-known uh, cardiologist, Eric Topol, has two very well-known books. The first book is called The Patient Will See You Now. So he says, we typically say the doctor will see you now, but today the patient will come with all the data. The mobile phone is his lab, is this thing, it has all the data, and he'll say, I've read all the reports and now doctor, can we discuss what do you do for me, right? It's a different thing. He has another book called Deep Medicine, which is the application of uh, deep learning to medicine and so on. And the reason why an AI is better is that when you're dealing with a doctor, you're dealing with the experience of one doctor. When you're dealing with an AI system, you're dealing with the experience of thousands of doctors from all over analyzed in a way which was done by mathematics. And therefore things which I might have forgotten, et cetera, are not important. So this is where when it becomes important. Now, I will do this a little bit step by step. Uh, don't feel it is trivialized, but I'm trying to draw boundaries. So automation is something which came relatively recently at times. And I remember I was most fascinated when as a young child, I would open the refrigerator and the light would come up. 
and then I close it, light would go. I, see, everywhere else, I had to switch off the light. I had to switch off the light. The fridge somehow knew that I've opened the fridge and it switches on the light. This is automation. Then there was a time when I saw a uh, door open a door and it closes by itself because there's a spring attached somewhere and so on and so forth. So we had this automation where the automation was in the hardware. When computers came, the first time automation was in the software. So hardware was the same. You loaded Excel, it will do something. You loaded PowerPoint, it will do something. The hardware was the same, but the software kept on changing. But the software did whatever it was programmed to do. In AI, the software learns from data. And therefore, the more data you give it, the more it learns like an experienced human being. And because it is a machine, it does not make the normal mistakes which humans do. They forget something, they have some bias, they ignore something, they do not do something. And that is why it becomes better and better. So what we say, and I'll quote a precise definition, don't get uh, worried. A learning algorithm for a given task T with performance measure P is such that the performance measure P improves with experience E. Now, this will firstly set you at rest that it is for a given task. So if I have trained a computer to recognize a face, it can recognize the face, but maybe not the voice. If told to recognize the voice, it can do that. If it's been given text to speech, speech to text. It will. So it is for a given task. Humans can do so many tasks with very small switching speed. Computers today can also. This is called narrow intelligence. It's becoming better and better, but on those terms. Artificial general intelligence is somewhat like humans where we can quickly switch between various things. She can be talking about this. She can also remember that he had met that person there, something else had happened, and so on. So machines are nowhere near general intelligence today. They're nowhere near, although some progress is made, and you should be uh, looking at this term, GPT-3, with great interest, because this is the first attempt at artificial general intelligence, and Keep exploring GPT-3 in education. It will write poetry, it will write computer code, et cetera, et cetera. And it is a very important question. What does an educated person mean in the era where GPT-3 is already there? Now, the point I'm trying to say is, and I seriously want to see the mobile phone, many people have accepted, and this is going to be the key thing. And some people also talked about self-learning. And I often use this word, we first learn to use the mobile, then we use the mobile to learn. And now once you do this, that has been done. I am seriously suggesting that if you haven't experienced this so far, download a free app called Duolingo. Duolingo, D-U-O-L-I-N-G-O. Duolingo is a language learning app which is driven by AI and is an amazing experience. It will give you some idea of what do we mean by an AI driven education. It is free. Originally, it was basically English as your base language, and you could learn German, French, Italian, whatever you want with it. It has all these elements of personalization, et cetera, et cetera, built in. Now they even have a version where you can learn English from Hindi and so on and so forth. So Duolingo is one of the best popular free examples of an AI-driven learning app. And there are many others. For mathematics, there is IMAPS, there is this thing, thing. But this one is the very, very enjoyable one. So what we are trying to say is that when we're talking about mobile learning, we're not talking of these lectures being reproduced and given on Zoom, etc. No, you will have learning apps. And Duolingo is a very good example to see that here is a, something which is like that. Now you may want to improve it, see it. I'm not saying this is the final thing, but I'm saying this will give you an idea what does AI-driven education mean. Uh, I think uh, Rahul Bhatia talked about various apps which are doing for exam this, this, this. So the stage is ready now. It is no longer something which will happen in the future. It is already there. We need to put it together and get on with it. So I'm very delighted. And I think what we will have is the team will follow up with you. But I think very quickly, if we can identify or 10 universities can come up and volunteer that we want to take the active part in making this happen, then it will be a good starting point for our next thing. 
So thank you, Captain, for two hours of captaining us. Now it's all yours. Thank you so much, sir. A spark, education three to one, is the next step in thought process when we have started talking beyond 21st century learning. The ideas today were tremendous and diverse, but from elite group of educationists. And we started from what to change and moved towards how. Now the time has come to work for when to change. And that is the time now today after listening to all the speakers. Let us hold hands and take it forward. Thank you all for wonderful uh, insights and uh, wonderful uh, uh, inputs as far as uh, the education is concerned. Thank you, EduTV, for bringing it forward and Pansa for being torch bearer and pathfinder. Over to you, Mr. Pranav, for creating a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, Professor M.M. Pant, who ideated it. I would like to thank Captain Dinisha also, for all the way from Malaysia, she's moderating the show. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Tarun Anand, who is one of my first clients. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Amola Roda, uh, Dr. Uh, Mehboob from Bangladesh, I would like to thank. I would like to thank Madam Arshana Surana from Arch College of Design and Business. I would like to thank Dr. Abhay Kumar, Vice Chancellor of Pratap University. I would like to uh, thank Professor Ranjit Singh, Vice Chancellor of Shobhit University. I would like to thank Dr. Kuldeep Singh, who is the Dean of Ames uh, Jodhpur. Thanks, Mr. Sundeepan Reddy. And we will take it further this way. Any thoughts you have, you can write to us. Uh, otherwise, next uh, in the next session, we'll, we'll take it to the next level. And we'll keep you posted. And more people will be joining us. Thank you so much, Pansad. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thank you all the best. Thanks for joining. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tarun, sir. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.